ele terminou o doutorado dele em 2006, né? depois passou um ano na Alemanha, em Hamburgo, né? e depois voltou para a Itália, onde ele conseguiu essa posição no Senar, onde ele está até hoje. O Cristo ele trabalha num grupo que é especialista em, em produção de fontes de lasers pulsados, ultra curtos, lasers de 100 segundos. Não somente isso, esse grupo ele é especialista também em fazer espectroscopia ótica nesse três. Então o Cristo já está interagindo no Brasil já há algum tempo, tanto conosco quanto no grupo de Minas Gerais. E hoje eu descobri que as raízes brasileiras deles são mais antigas. Ele tem um bisavô que veio para o Brasil há muito tempo atrás. Né? Então, Christian. Digerou um passo de você. Welcome. Thank you. They are all yours. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction. I believe. Wow. I believe you can hear me. Did you turn it on? Yes. I turned it on. Yes. of femtosecond pulses. But actually here I would like to talk to you about a new activity that I started a few years ago, and it's about hyperspectral uh, imaging and microscopy. And in particular, uh, actually, uh, it, it, it's pretty interesting because the activity started as a consequence for some experiments that we were doing in the femtosecond regime. But with femtosecond regime we talk about lasers, and here today, I will not mention lasers at all, or maybe just at the, in the last part, because here I'm talking about imaging and microscopy with incoherent radiation. So no laser is involved in this case. Now, as you can see here, I already displaced, uh, uh, together with my name, I also displaced the name of all the other people who some way took part to the experiment. So it's a sort of already it's a sort of way to make the acknowledgement uh, of all the people who took part to the activity and to the uh, experiments. Okay. Okay. So, now I think you can hear me even better probably, right? Great. Okay, so, uh, Let's start a little bit. Ah, since I'm working with lasers almost every day, I will not use the laser pointer today. Okay. <laughs> Let's go back to the old technology, which is still working anyway. Uh, so, in, the, the, in this talk, I will in introduce you about the Fourier transform spectral imaging, which is a part of Fourier transform spectroscopy. And then I will show you two possible applications of this Fourier transform imaging. One is a, uh, the hyperspectral camera for really taking images of large objects. And another one is hyperspectral microscope to take microscopic images. Eh? And so here I also listed the people who uh, took part to the various experiments. Um, in particular, I will show you some applications to cultural heritage, just to show you uh, uh, what actually also motivated my, my work mainly. So let's start from a Fourier transform spectral imaging. Before going into Fourier transform, let's focus on spectral imaging here. Okay? So spectral imaging means that I'm going to take an image resolved in spectrum. So for each point of the image, I have also some spectral information. Now, with any kind of camera, including the smartphones, actually, you already do some kind of spectral imaging. Because when you collect a picture, a color picture, you collect the picture in three bands, the red, the green, and the blue one. So, three bands. So, 
spectral imaging is already done, let's say, by, by ordinary cameras. But what you do in ordinary cameras is what this is called multi-spectral imaging. That is, you collect a limited number of pictures in a limited number of bands. And typically, these bands are well separated from each other. So this is one way of collecting images. You select some bands. Otherwise, you can also have the so-called hyperspectral image. Well, with hyperspectral, I mean that from each point you have the complete, the whole spectrum. Not only sampled in three wavelengths, but the whole spectrum in all the frequency range. The uh, wealth of information that you have, so this is spatial coordinate, and this is frequency coordinate, the whole amount of information that you, are, that you get is so-called um, spectral hypercube. Okay? While in ordinary RGB pictures, you typically only have three pictures, three levels, eight bits for each picture. Here we have a, we call it hypercube. Now, um, here actually there are these two kinds of imaging, which also reflect the historical um, evolution of imaging. Uh, I would also, anyway, describe the historical, well, in, a nice example of historical evolution of imaging is also if you want, given by uh, this lady here. Okay, she is Queen Elizabeth II. Okay, in black and black and white. So, at the very uh, early stage of photography, it was black and white. Then came the multispectral imaging. Okay, <laughs> here you have multispectral imaging. So, luckily now you can see the various colors of the pink. A limited number of colors. But then the evolution will be the hyperspectral imaging with all the possible tones of the thing. Actually, hyperspectral imaging is not the end. Because there is also another higher level of, of imaging, which is ultraspectral imaging. In a sense, what we do is ultraspectral imaging, but it's not, it's not very well used. We don't, I don't use ultraspectral imaging, but the queen does. Because indeed, actually, the shades of color that she's using is much, much, much larger. Here also, you can really see a spectral characterization of the queen, okay? Because here, for 4% of her time, she dresses in yellow, 11% in green, and so on and so forth. So you can also draw a spectrum of the queen if you want, okay? This was done by Yvonne some time ago. Okay, so just, just to, uh, uh, to show you that somebody is really using all the possible colors in nature, okay? Now, how to acquire uh, all the colors of the queen? So how to acquire uh, spectral images? Hmm? So here I show you three possible ways, the three ways that typically are used to acquire spectral images. One, the first one is the easiest, it's called snapshot imaging. Uh, it means that in one shot you get all the spectrum. Well, actually, part of it. And it's pretty easy because on, uh, it's obtained like this. On your um, detector, you place simply a mosaic of filters. And this is already done in RGB cameras because on the, sen the sensor is typically black and white, and on top of it, they place the red, green, and blue filters, okay, RGB, the Bayer filter. Um, but Okay, of course, here, as you can see, you have a limited number of colors. So in RGB, you only have three colors. If you want, you can increase the number of colors, but of course, you lose the spatial resolution, okay? Uh, if you don't want to lose the spatial resolution, then you can go, for example, to the staring image, which means that you take a picture uh, of a scene, but in front of the camera, you place some filters Again, now, you gain spatial resolution, but you're not gaining spectral resolution because, anyway, you are limited by the number of filters that you're using here. A third way to do this, to do spectral imaging, is by using really a spectrometer. So what about taking a spectrometer, which is able to collect the whole spectrum of an image, and put it in front of a camera? Well, you can do that, but the only problem is that you have to either to acquire each point at a time, so you acquire a spectrum from each point, this is called raster scanning, or you can also do the push bloom scanning, which means that you acquire, actually, you put a field, a, 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 let's say, you use a spectrometer, but use a two-dimensional spectrometer, and so you acquire a line of your picture, and then you go to the next line, so on and so forth. So you acquire 
the spectrum of each line of the picture. This is called, called the push broom imaging. Uh, if you buy, uh, commercially speaking, let's say, uh, hyperspectral cameras are already available, and actually they use this technology here, the push broom imaging. Okay? However, there is another way to get spectral information from a beam, from light. And the other way is called the uh, Fourier transform spectroscopy. The idea is the following of Fourier transform spectroscopy. It's based on the wiener kinching theory, and it tests the following. If you have a, a field, which could be a light field, and you generate two replicas of the field, and then you delay them, and you go into one detector, what you get actually, as a function of the delay, you get this function here, which is called the interferogram. So what you do is you, you take a, I don't know, a, a beam of light, which could be a laser, it could be a pulse of laser, but it could be any kind of radiation. You split into two, you go into one detector point, you collect as a function of time, you get the interferogram, and then if you take the Fourier transform of the interferogram, then you get the intensity spectrum. This here is the Fourier, the, the wiener kinching theory. So it's possible to demonstrate that we coherent and incoherent radiation, actually, by taking the Fourier transform of the interferogram, you, you get the spectrum. Now, uh, this technique here is, has some advantages with respect to an ordinary spectrometer. I mean, one could say, wait a second, why should I take this measurement here, so generate two replicas, change the delay, acquire the interferogram, and take the Fourier transform? Why should I do like this? Why not using an ordinary spectrometer? Well, because this technique has some advantages over an ordinary spectrometer. For example, it has much higher optical throughput, and the resolution, you choose the resolution, for example, and there is also another advantage here, which is parallel acquisition. I will show you what the consequences of this. But actually, the fact that this technique is, has such advantages with respect to an ordinary spectrometer is demonstrated by this publication here. So the very first field in which Fourier transform spectroscopy was used to measure spectra was in astronomy, where you have very little amount of photons, and you would like to use all of them, not to disperse them into a spectrometer and into maybe, I don't know, 1,000 pixels of a spectrometer. You would like to collect all the light and then deduce the spectrum. This is possible in the Fourier transform spectrometer because as you can see here, I am only using one detector where I'm sending all the light. And indeed, in 1966, it was used to measure, for the first time, the spectrum of uh, Orion Nebula, okay? So in astronomy. But actually, I was mentioning that there is another advantage of uh, Fourier transform spectroscopy, which is the parallel acquisition, which means the following. Now, here I am using only one detector. But what if, instead of going into the detector with a field, a beam of light, what if I go into the detector with an image? So I generate two images. I go into the detector, which is in this case, it's a two-dimensional detector, that is a camera. Well, then I can collect many images as a function of time. And if I sit on each pixel of this image, then I will get the interferogram. So that if I take the Fourier transform at each pixel of the image, I will get the spectrum at that picture, pixel of the image. Okay, so thanks to the fact that I uh, Fourier transform, um, that I can get the spectrum by making Fourier transform, and thanks to the fact that actually this can be made parallel, because instead of using one detector, I use many detectors, actually here I have uh, a, a technique which enables me to measure and record the spectrum for each pixel of the image. Now, of course, there is a price to pay. And the price to pay in this case is that you have to be very precise in adjusting the delay. Very, 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 very precise. The precision which is required here is that you need to adjust the delay of the image with the precision of an accuracy better than one hundredth of an optical cycle. Okay? Which means that in the visible, the wavelength is 600 nanometers. The optical cycle is 2 femtoseconds. 100 of 2 femtoseconds means that you should be, have a precision higher than 20 attoseconds. If you have a device which enables to generate such a delay with a precision of 20 attoseconds, then 
then you can, you can do uh, um, Fourier transform imaging, spectroscopy, and imaging. Now, how to generate these this two beams or how to generate two images? What's the basic technique that can be used in order to generate two replicas? Well, uh, I think that everybody knows the Michelson interferometer, for example. That's a way to generate two replicas. You go in with one field, you separate that into two replicas, delay line, and you, then you have the output. The delay, by moving the delay line here, you are able to change the delay. The problem of this Michelson interferometer is that it's prone to um, perturbation, vibration of these mirrors, for example. Huh? And so this, this device here, in principle, can work, but it's very critical for the visible and the uh, ultraviolet spectral range, where the optical cycle is very short. And so we had to um, develop other techniques. So here, for example, here is an example taken from the literature, in which, for example, one way to generate the two replicas is by placing a grating here, you separate the replicas into two replicas here, and then by placing a piece of glass in the middle or a plate which you rotate, you are able to change the delay. But again, this is prone to some uh, uh, instabilities because, uh, as you can see, the beam is split into two parts here. Okay? Geometrically, it's split into two parts. So it's working, but it's still not the best, and indeed, Let's say the, the fluctuation that they got in this paper here was particularly high. Actually, we are using another technique, which is based on birefringence. So the idea is uh, based on birefringence is particularly simple. I believe that many of you has used birefringence at a certain point in the lab if they use if they work with optics. But the idea of a birefringent material is the following: a birefringent material is a transparent material which actually has two refractive indices. Which means that, um, mm -hmm. let's say, you can, in this material, you can identify an optical axis. And so if you enter with your light with a polarization, which is parallel to the optical axis, it, it, it travels with a, with a given speed. If the polarization is normal to the optical axis, it travels with another speed. So the two polarizations actually experience two different speeds in the propagation. Okay? This means that, for example, if you have a beam and you polarize it at 45 degrees with your respect to your crystal, then half of the energy will be along this polarization, half of the energy will be on the, let's say, orthogonal polarization, and so you have that half of the pulse will travel with a delay and the other half with another delay. The result is that you come in with one pulse and you come out with two pulses. Pulses or light beams, which is the same, which are delayed by tau. And I can tell you that this delay is not oscillating at all. Whatever happens in the world, okay, apart from melting the crystal, of course, whatever happens, uh, this is solid rock. So this delay here is never changing. So we have built a me in, in let's say a very little Michelson interferometer. The only problem here, well, what's the problem here? So no changes means 1% of change, or 0% of change. Uh, OK, 0% that I, I will show you. So it means exactly nothing depends on yeah. the frequency. Exactly. All, so almost no Exactly. So we took, we measured the delay of the two pulses by interferometry, for example, for half an hour. So every millisecond we acquired a spectrum for half an hour. The fluctuations in half an hour was few attoseconds, so one over 400 times the optical cycle. So one over 400, and I believe that this one over 400 was only due to the spectrometer, the noise introduced by the spectrometer. So in principle here, you are really, you are not changing the delay or very little, much less than what you need. The problem here, in a way, is that you cannot change the delay. So it's very good that you can't. It's very bad because you can't. Okay? <laughs> uh, because the Fourier transfer needs to change the delay, but here I can't. So 
Actually, what we did was the following. Instead of using one plate, we used two plates. One which is like this, which is introducing a certain delay. The second plate has an optical axis which is reversed. And so the first one introduces a positive delay, the second one a negative delay. Okay. Uh, but again, the plates introduce a fixed delay unless you cut one of the two plates in triangles. And by moving the triangles, you are able to change the thickness of one of the two plates. So here, by moving this plate, as indicated by this arrow here, you are able to change the total thickness of the second plate. Why do I, so by, by moving this one, then I, I'm able to get any delay. And why do I need two plates? I need two plates because in this way I can if the thickness of the two plates is exactly the same, I will get delay zero. If this plate here is a bit larger, I will get a negative delay. If this plate here is a little bit thinner, I will get a positive delay. So I can scan really all the possible delays from positive to negative. This device here actually was built because we needed to generate two pulses, and that's the reason why in my pictures you always see pulses of light. We needed to generate two femtosecond pulses where the delay had to be adjusted by with a very high precision. So this was the original idea which was also patented later. Uh, but then, and here if you want we have the characterization. So the size of this device here is roughly four centimeters. So it's, we have a Michelson interferometer which is as, as big as this one. Okay? Uh, so, the, um, ah, yeah, the stability is not 1 over, well, it depends on the wavelength, but here I put 1 over 300 instead of 1 over 400, but it depends on the wavelength, actually. For the UV, it's 1 over 400, for the infrared zone. Then, uh, the bandwidth is, of course, it depends on the transparency of this material, okay, and of the detector that you place here, of course. And the resolution, as you know, in the, in the Michelson, in the Fourier transfer spectroscopy, the resolution is given by how long you are able to scan. And the length of the scan depends on how large is this movement, or also how thick are the plates. So this is something that you can design and build. Now, let's see uh, how can this very little interferometer, how it can be used. Richard, yeah? Go ahead. Uh, what happens if you build those uh, with optical fibers? With the optical, optical fibers or optical guys. They are not sensitive to the movement or anything. So you can build a microscope. Yeah. The front of the fiber can be very small. Yeah, correct. And they perform as good as these. Correct. Or it's not uh, a complete wide movement. Yeah. So, well, from femtosecond pulses, of course, that could be the problem of dispersion. Right? Yeah. For imaging, then. Okay, if I can use these fibers for imaging, but wide field imaging, then it's fine. I, at the moment, I'm not aware of, I mean, I, I'm not used to use fibers to take images, okay, unless you do raster scanning. But of course, if it's, uh, it could maybe work also in fibers. The only problem is how do you change the delay in the fibers? Ah, playing with the dispersion of the fiber. Okay, oh, but then, okay, so you are able to generate delays of picoseconds also. Even, well. You can play with fiber. Yeah, no, the problem is that here you need delays of uh, many optical cycles, also some picoseconds. Yeah, so then we can discuss about that because that could be very interesting for other applications that they have been. Uh, okay. So now let's see how this uh, interferometer can be used for to, to implement the hyperspectral camera. Uh, now, this picture here really represents the camera that we developed. So this is three to four centimeters big. Okay, three to four centimeters it depends. Actually, it depends only on the mechanics that you can find. If you can find very thin mechanics, you can go down to 30 millimeters. And this is a camera that you can buy. This is a black and white camera, CMOS black and white camera from Toblox, and also the objective of from Toblox. So nothing very peculiar, okay? Um, okay, let's see what we got. So the very first test 
that we did on our camera, and the camera means that really I can take pictures of a wide object, was to see where what was to yeah, I was to see whether the camera was really able to measure spectra, calibrated spectra. And so for this, we took an image of a, uh, these five disks. Here, of course, you see them in black and white, because this is a single frame image with a, our uh, a monochromatic camera. But these disks are colored, and they, these disks in particular are calibrated disks, which are used to calibrate also um, cameras. Okay, color of cameras. So, in particular, these disks are, uh, we have the, a, a yellow one, sorry, a green one, yellow, red, blue, and the white in the center. And also, maybe you can see that there are these two spots here, because in, together with the disks, we also sent a couple of lasers, a red and the, and the green one, just to see if we could take all the information from this scene. And so then we recorded. The, uh, the, we took the interferon, so we took many images, I think four or five, uh, 500 images, and let's see what we got. So if you take one pixel here from the yellow, uh, one pixel here from the yellow, and then you have a collection of many images as a function of the delay, but if you take one pixel here, what you get here is this interferogram, single scan interferogram, okay, uh, which is very short, because the light reflected by the yellow is particularly broadband. Okay? Uh, this interferogram here is, on the other hand, the interferogram for, of the green laser here, this point here. Since it is narrow band, the interferogram lasts, let's say, forever. So it lasts over a huge amount of cycles. Uh, so the, the, best, the, the best way to measure this, this laser is to really to take a very, very, very long scan. So in this case, we acquired the whole image, the whole temporal hypercube, which took less than 30 seconds. And let's see what we got. So this is the, these are the reflectivity spectra measured by, our, the, by the device. So uh, this, the solid line are really the spectra that used after taking the Fourier transfer, while the dashed lines are the reflectivity of the various disks tabulated, calibrated, because they come also with the calibration, because they are used really to calibrate scientific instruments. And so as you can see here, we are able to, there is an almost complete overlap between the calibrated spectra and the spectra measured by our camera. So uh, this, this demonstrates actually that we, uh, our camera is, acts as a spectrometer, but in particular, it acts as a two-dimensional spectrometer, which enables to take the spectrum of each pixel of the image. Here also, you have the spectra of the two lasers, okay, the, the, the green and the red laser. And the thickness of that laser is telling you the, uh, the spectral resolution, which in our case was 4 nanometers because of the length of the scan. But it can be improved by increasing the, the, the length of the scan. And here are then some examples. So one example was uh, uh, to really to measure works of art. This is an Egyptian cartonnage, um, I think 3,000 years old, this one. And we wanted to measure the reflectivity spectrum, because from the reflectivity spectrum, we can also get information about the pigments, which, which is on the surface. And also, uh, and the, yeah, and the reflectivity spectrum is actually these lines here, these solid dash and solid lines here. So here you can see the reflectivity in three points of the image, the red one, the dark blue one, and the orange one. This is particularly interesting because we, you can clearly see the colors, but this measurement is telling you that you see colors, but actually the spectral differences, in particular between the red and the orange, are very, very little. So this is also telling us that our eyes are making really a great job in finding very little spectral differences, because indeed you can see a colored image here. This image here was synthesized by the spectra. So it was not taken by an RGB camera. It was taken by the black and white, and then by measuring the spectrum, then we could synthesize the RGB in order to make it colored. But also, by pumping with an LAD with a 600 nanometer wavelength, we could see the fluorescence. And in particular, 
uh, there is an, an, a dye here which is called Egyptian blue, which is fluorescing around the yeah, infrared, around 900 nanometers. This is the this this one here is the emission spectrum, so the fluorescence spectrum of the Egyptian blue. And so by uh, actually then we could synthes synthesize uh, a, let's say a false color image of the fluorescent part. And here we can see, for example, where you can find the, the Egyptian blue which is located not everywhere, but in only in some decorations of the This was just a very first example. However, however, oh yes, uh, this spectrum here is very boring, if you look at this. I mean, we built a hyperspectral camera interesting because we wanted to measure spectra interesting. Then we measured spectra and we found out that they are particularly boring, let's say. So they, they change very little. Eh? And so, uh, then we, we had to, to look for samples, or to look for some examples which, in which the, the spectrum is changing a lot. Okay? And actually this happens in, in uh, colored glass. Because the colored glass is actually glass in which you put some nanoparticles, and so there you have absorption peaks or absorption lines, which make the spectrum a little bit less boring. And this is what we did. So we went into a church, and we took the picture of this uh, artistic glass window here. Uh, this, this is particularly large, so we took various parts of this image. Okay, this represents the Last Supper, and in particular here you have the various uh, disciples. And then we focused on one part of the image. We focused. We decided to take a, a high resolution image here of, of the the parts. Uh, um, with the sword and, and the moon, which is actually the symbol of uh, Saint John. Okay, Saint John. The one of uh, Camino de Santiago, actually. Okay? And indeed, this is these one, two, and three are the symbols of uh, the Camino de Santiago. Okay? Uh, okay, so we took the image of this, and this is the result that we got. We took the correlation, we took the spectra, and here are some examples of the same image sliced at various wavelengths. So you can clearly see that I, I chose six wavelengths, and there are, you, there are no two identical pictures here, which means that in each spectral band, something different is happening. Okay? So this is much less boring, in my opinion, than uh, any other picture, because colored glass has this very interesting peculiarity. And this is the synthesized picture. So taking all the information, of course, not only in these six bands, but at any nanometer of the, of the spectrum, then we could synthesize the, 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 the color image. If you want, uh, we can also see, let's say, a movie with all the possible wavelengths uh, of, of this picture. So we start from the ultraviolet. And then when we go towards the visible, you can clearly see the various colors which are appearing and disappearing. Okay? And this was obtained actually uh, not by placing filters in front of the image, but by taking the Fourier transform. So collecting data and taking the Fourier transform. Now in particular, here you don't see that, but there are some blue tiles which at sight at, 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 um, my eye looks quite similar. Actually, the picture is already revealing that they are uh, different, but here there are many blue tiles here around. And so we wanted to see the, very, the various differences. So we, we, actually, once you have the spectrum, then you can analyze the picture. And for example, you can find a way to group the various colors if they, they have the same spectrum. And, for example, we wanted to see how many blue tiles of different blue tiles we had. And we found out, actually, that there are five types of blue tiles. Mm -hmm. They are mapped here according to the spectra that we could, that, that we could uh, uh, measure. And in particular, the tile number five, uh, no, which one? Oh, no, 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 the tile number three, which was this one, this one here, was probably replaced later after it was uh, this last window was done because that's the only tile which is not transmitting in the infrared. So probably they changed the technology to to, to to make this tile. So we could also identify that one tile 
had been at certain point reflexed. Okay? So this is just to give you an example of uh, uh, of, of the goal of the imaging, okay? uh, which allows you also to discriminate the various objects in an image according to the spectrum. Here we have also other examples. So at a certain point we also went to Viterbo, which is a city close to Rome, to take a picture of this table here. This table belongs to Michelangelo, Michelangelo Bonarotti. And the reason why we went to Viterbo to take the picture here was the following. Okay, here we have a summary of the various spectra in various parts of the image, which is telling you also which kind of pigment was used by Michelangelo. For example, here, this blue here, we found out according to the spectrum. The spectrum here is typical of lapis lazuli, which is a very, very expensive blue, and which is telling that probably the person who asked Michelangelo to make this painting was a very rich person. But it's, this is not the interesting part. So if we look at the whole picture, then you can see, for example, this is the face of one of the two thieves. This is the face of the other thief. So all the faces are really beautiful in the painting. Unfortunately, here in the screen and in the computer, it's not so easy. But I can tell you that uh, uh, really the faces are beautiful. Of course, it's Michelangelo. Okay. And, uh, except for, except for, uh, St. John. St. John here is, well, is particularly ugly, okay? It's not very nice to see, okay? But it's Michelangelo, okay? So what happened here? Ah, and also the, the, here, the face of Christ is not very nice, but this is because it was replaced then at a certain point, because Michelangelo painted Christ with opened eyes, and the church didn't like it. And so they replace the face, then they close the eyes. <laughs> but the interesting story is that the, uh, associated to this painting, is there is a letter from Victoria Colonna to Michelangelo, who says, well, I, uh, uh, okay, th this is the, the Italian version, but the English translation says, I saw the painting with the glass, the light, and the mirror. And that's amazing. Full stop. The question is, what did she see? Okay, what was so peculiar about this painting, and in particular, what light, what glass, and what mirror did she use? So I don't know anything about the mirror, but about the light, it was probably candlelight or sunlight, which is reddish in some way, and the glass was probably a blue glass. And so this suggested us uh, to, okay, first of all, to use a blue glass. And indeed, something happens if you look at the painting with the blue glass. And then I said, okay, instead of using a filter, let's take a hyperspectral image of, the, of this painting and let's see what comes out. Actually, what came out is the following. St. John, again, probably the picture will be very dark, so I will try to describe what you see here. So this is the picture of St. John. Then we took a hyperspectral image. This is the image at 650 nanometers, okay, so in the red. Uh, Okay, in the red, and so as you can see in the red, it's particularly, it's even more ugly. Also the hands are not very nice, okay? It's, uh, okay. But then, and now let's see if it works. Uh, if you go to the blue, okay, to 450 nanometers, now the hands get much nicer, and the face gets much, let's say, thinner, with much more details. Also the eyes are much better here. Okay, the resolution here is not the best. We can try to compare the two pictures here, but you can clearly see that the cheeks are much thinner, for example, if you look that at the blue, in the blue spectrum. Right? So, uh, it, it means that here, by using actually the colors, Michelangelo uh, wanted to tell, so wanted to change the face of St. John. Actually, St. John is particularly important in the tradition of, of of the church, and so there are many stories around St. John, and so probably Michelangelo wanted to hide something. Michelangelo and Vittoria Colonna were part of the same group, secret group, which was around Europe again, about religion, and so probably they wanted to hide the message. But actually, the hyperspectral image was able to reveal a little bit of difference between the two faces in the blue and in the red, as probably Vittoria Colonna was experimenting. You, I think you can switch on the light again, because it's... Uh... Okay, 
Then, okay, there are other examples. So we went to take a picture of an island, okay, so outside. Uh, here, for example, you can see the spectra. Yeah, look at the spectra here. Here there are the trees. So blue, red, and, and yellow. Blue, red, and yellow. As you can see, there are the two peaks here, around 800 and 850. This is the fluorescence okay, of uh, the chlorophyll. And so here we can clearly we can say that all the trees here were alive, okay, and they were true. They were not plastic trees. Okay? But of course this was a, a, a taken from a, a, a mountain, and so I was not expecting to get any plastic here around. But in principle, if there is something which is fake here, or if there are some trees which are dead, you will not see those peaks. And so, by, by the spectrum, actually, you can get information about all the image. Here, this is the lake, actually, and the spectrum that you get here is actually the spectrum from the sky, which is reflected on the lake. That's why it is so broad bandwidth. This is the uh, RGB image synthesized from the spectra, and this is, again, the same image um, as a function of the wavelength. In this case, we, go, we are going from the infrared to the blue. Okay, so in the visible spectral range, nothing is happening. But, as you can see, in the infrared, then we are reversing the contrast, because in the infrared, here we have the emission from the plants, and then when we go to the visible, then you, 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 you change the contrast, because the leaves are absorbing in the visible, and not emitting it. Okay, as a last part of this talk, quite quick, very quickly, I would like to show you that we also, and this is very new, because the previous result was actually published, but this is, it. This is going to be published. And uh, it's an implementation of a microscope. So the question is, can we take microscope images with the same technique? And the idea uh, was, OK, we have to place the interferometer somewhere in the microscope. This is a very basic scheme of a microscope. The objective, a tube lens, and the detector. So we, you can place the interferometer in principle, wherever you want. Actually, there are some places which are very wrong, because there you will not be able to get any interferogram, and places which are very good. This is one of the two places where it is very good. It gives interferogram with very high contrast. And uh, it's, uh, this is an example of interferogram that you could get. The interesting thing is that the contrast is very high. But for example, interferogram is a little bit delayed, right and left, if you change the pixel of the image. So the interferogram has slightly shifted in time if you change the pixel of the image. It's not a problem at all, okay, in general. But it's, uh, sometimes it's better to have uh, that all the interferograms have a zero exactly in the same position. And do not shift if you change the pixel of the image. So, this is the second implementation, which is this one. Simply by moving the interferometer from one point to another point of the optical chain, you completely change what's happening. And so in this case, for example, all the interferograms come together. Uh, and the contrast, unfortunately, reduces by 15%. But it's not a problem again. Uh, an example, that the very first example that we wanted to image was uh, the screen the high resolution screen of a smartphone. So we put the smartphone under a microscope. And let's see what we got. This is here at the left. Uh, this is the image that you get when you change the delay. So as a function of time, when you take the interferogram, this is the image that you, are, that you are getting. So here you can clearly see that the light is going up and down, up and down. So it's an interferogram. And each of these ones is an emitter of the phone. And each emitter emits at a different wavelength. And so, of course, you will see that the beating of the oscillation of the image actually changes according to the, the, the pixel. This is the, the result. So from, for example, this pixel here, we found out that the emission was in the blue. This pixel here it had emission in the green. And this one there had emission in the red. This was a, this is a, a Samsung. Okay, the Samsung screen is done like this. So you have this a sort of diamond-like pixel. This one is a pixel actually with the four emitters, 
these are the spectra and from the spectra of course we could reconstruct the RGB color of the of, of the pixel of the smartphone. Okay? We did the same of course not only with the Samsung but we wanted to try that also with an iPhone. Ah but before that you probably well it's hard to see but you will probably see that here for example there is also a pattern a very little pattern we found out that the little pattern there was that each emitter itself was emitting light at different wavelengths and so by knowing by recording the spectrum we could see really the difference of the spectrum of each point of each emitter of the screen so here you can see with different colors actually we evidenced the different emission spectra from each, uh, from each point here since the differences were really 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 very little in this panel here I represent the difference between the spectra okay which uh, for the blue and the green in particular they are telling me that each point here there is probably a little shift which is maybe due to the electronics so this one in our opinion is the shape of the electronic circuit which is beyond the, uh, the, the, the emitter of the smartphone. We analyzed only this pixel here, but in principle you could do the same with the whole image. And this is possible only if you have high resolution spec. Of course, we did the same with the uh, um, iPhone, okay, just, for, just, just to, to be fair and to take the images for both of them. The geometry is completely different. So again, here, all the pixels are illuminated. Simply I'm changing the delay of the interferometer. And by changing the delay, you can clearly see that light switches on and off. But the, the, the screen was lit, completely lit, was white. Eh? It was yeah, very clear. And again, here you get the reconstructed image after taking the Fourier transform of these uh, uh, oscillations. Of course, we were not only applying that on screen, which is a fluorescent device with very high fluorescence, but also this is a picture of some zeolite crystals. And uh, uh, you can, we could measure, they are, look like reddish because of their emission, or sorry, of their absorption. They, they absorb, uh, let's say, in, 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 um, their absorption is very high in the blue spectral range, so they look reddish. But actually, it's, uh, 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 it's impossible to measure the absorption spectrum if you have a powder because of scattering issues. But if you are able to see each of them on a microscope and you, measure, you can measure the spectrum at each point, then you are able to get the absorption spectrum for each point on the cell. So the microscope is also ne uh, necessary if you have a highly scattering cell. And then we took also images of other biological elements. For example, these pollen grains. And uh, this is the black and white image, and this is the corresponding uh, color image after uh, measuring all the spectra. And then also these uh, cells here, but we could clearly uh, distinguish between mitochondria and uh, the uh, F actin inside the cell. So here there are the two images in the two because actually the uh, actin is emitting in this band and the mitochondria are emitting in this other band. But this is because the sample was dyed in specific dyes. And um, the last image here is, uh, this is also uh, very interesting because with only one illumination, which was around five, uh, 480 nanometers in the blue, we were able to distinguish the nuclei and the membrane of some cells which were um, on purpose so this is a membrane unfortunately it's broken here but this is part of the membrane uh, which uh, are actually emitting at two different colors so one more to the blue and the other one more to the red the, and the emission actually the emission ratio was very very different from each other but then we could clearly distinguish of course, if you, can tr you can, if you can see the spectra of a sample, you are also able to tell something about the chemistry of that sample. That's the reason why it's very important to take uh, spectral images also at the microscope level. So with this, I would like to conclude, because I have introduced you um, the, the hyperspectral camera, which is based on a Fourier transform spectroscopy actually applied to a two-dimensional object. And it's 
I have shown you as a first example a wide field camera which is able to take uh, image, microscopic images, macroscopic images, sorry, and a microscope which is then able to take objects at the, at the size of um, micrometer level. I forgot to tell you that actually in the wide field camera we placed the interferometer in front of the camera that we assembled from, let's say, shelf and from components. While this one, the, the microscope one, was, uh, we took a Leica microscope, actually, so a commercial microscope, where there is enough space to place the three, four centimeters interferometer, and so we could actually transform a commercial microscope into a hyperspectral microscope, simply adding the, the, uh, the, the, the interferometer. Okay. So I've shown you also some examples about this, and, and, and uh, with this I would like to uh, thank you for all your attention. In that first picture, the figure there, what is the physical size of the interferometer? Yeah, physical, the physical size, which you mean this one? Yes. Four centimeters. Four centimeters by three. So quite little, I would say. And the thickness of each plate is 3.7 millimeters. It's easy to assemble in a camera. Yes. Yes. Quite easy. Then there are some issues that I didn't discuss because they are quite technical. So uh, the size of the wedges and so on. But, but, but it's, it's in front of the camera, and then we got this is what we did. And last week, uh, two weeks ago actually, we also tried this one with an infrared camera, which is even more difficult. But we found out that with an or by replacing this camera with an in-gas camera, that we could take images also in the infrared spectral range up to 1.7 microns without changing anything else. Because the transparency range of this here is from 200 nanometers to 4 microns. So it's working up to 4 microns. Uh, I'm wondering about the applications of like, consumer electronics. Uh, because it, it probably would need much data processing. Yeah, no. Is that the way? Well, not much. I mean, collecting the image yeah. takes one minute. Fourier transforming takes 30 seconds. One minute, if you want to do it very fun, okay? Then, then you can apply some techniques in order to find out, for example, this spectra here. So in the pixel, I could see very different spectra. This takes less than one minute. It depends on the, the kind of analysis, but if you have good spectra with good enough signal-to-noise ratio, and this was not an issue there, then you can really process the image quite, quite quickly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, so it's a, uh, but that that's a matter of the kind of computer that we're using for the calculation because it's a, uh, once you have the spectra, then it's pretty pretty simple to do that. Uh, questions? <laughs> yeah, I was wondering, but we we checked the report. This is all image from surface, right? Yes. So you can, if you combine these with the uh, coherence tomography, you can see where you can see it. Then you can see the, once you get the image from inside, then you can do the same analysis. In principle, yeah. Yes, and for this, indeed, I would also, yeah, I wanted to talk to you about that because that's also very interesting. But in principle, yeah. So this is a two dimensional. But, yeah, exploring three dimensions. What we were exploring was the dependence on time. For example, we were exploring the fluorescence. This I didn't tell you, but if, if this camera itself, not the collapse camera, but if this camera is gated, then in principle, then you shine UV light, a pulsed UV light, then the fluorescence itself, the spectrum of the fluorescence itself depends on time according to what you have. And 
So taking pictures as a function of frequency and as a function of time enables you to get additional information. Like flee. Correct. 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 So yeah, exactly. So uh, for example, we were able to see, it's possible to see in paintings, for example, you can discriminate between very modern dyes, OK? Uh, because modern dyes are, have some uh, also semiconductor particles which may have an emission which is different from old time dyes. And from, from that, then you can discriminate if there has been some artifact on the painting or some restoration in modern times. You can also, for example, remove the fluorescence or due to the, uh, the, the, the surface layer because some painters, after painting, put something on the surface just to make it more brilliant. This has an emission which is very short in time. So if you record the spectrum after some time, uh, some time after the excitation, you get information about the pigments and not on the surface. Uh, so this is to tell you, in, we took the image in space, in time, and of course in the third dimension it would be very interesting. You can think about yeah. it. This technique could be used to identify copies. Yes, we did that. But you have to have the original one. No. Compare? No. Um, in, for example, I didn't show the, I the image. So some weeks ago, we also took an image of a Klimt painting. Okay. A painting attributed to Klimt. Okay. But then we found out that um, uh, uh, one of the colors, I don't remember which one, one of the colors, according to the fluorescence of that color, the spectrum of the fluorescence. That color is a pigment which was not available at time of cleaning. Okay, so it was not a restoration, but definitely that was a copy or a fake. Probably a fake uh, and not a copy because there were not two, two of them. There was only one and so probably that one was a fake. More questions? There is one. Uh, some erased or blurred to make the color of the painting. Uh, once again, sorry, I didn't hear. Uh, some part of the paint are blurred or erased, almost in a different eye. Yeah. Would you tell me if you can identify that color or would it find? Well, in some cases, if there are some remainings, you can find out uh, which was the original, the original color. The, okay. Actually, what we found, what we did was the other way around. So there was a painting. Uh, we went to uh, Louvre because they had a painting that they wanted to analyze. And by looking at that, not in the visible, but in the infrared spectral range, we saw, for example, that one color that at naked eye looked uniform, at a certain point it was changed in the infrared spectral range. So we could not tell. We, we, uh, um, what happened there, but there was a change. So this we can see. If you remove some colors from the painting, but you do not remove 100% of the color, so some powder is remaining, then from that powder, of course, you can have information about what happened. But actually, even more interesting, some painters used to, not to cancel what was there, but to simply paint on top of it. So that in a painting you have two layers, one that you see and one that you don't see. These you can you can see something in the infrared, especially because the the typically the painters used to to draw the initial drawing with a pencil, with carbon, okay? And you can see the absorption of carbon in the infrared. So you, by taking the image of the in the infrared, you can see, for example, the layer of the initial drawing in carbon. And if there is something else, you can also see probably something else. But this is easier done in uh, in the X-rays because with X-rays, then you can clearly see also other other things. But it's possible. Have you ever thought of doing the art hobby? The page for our session. No, once again, sorry. Art hobby, the page of our session. I know I can't because I can't. Uh, uh, have you ever thought of using something yes? to intensify? Yes. Uh, erase it on. Ah, to intensify. See. Whoa. For from after all. Ha ha. Yeah, I mean, that's a very good idea. Yes. 
the, I mean, this is what restorators do. For example, they found out that uh, by looking at some paintings by Van Gogh, which some paintings which looked orange or dark yellow, actually originally it was not like that because the color faded. Okay, and how do they do they know that? That's simply because by doing a chemical analysis on point, then they, they could see what was the original color or what was the, was the original dye and then from that you can reconstruct the original color. Um, so this is typically done. Uh, if you can do chemical analysis it's good but also in my opinion if by taking spectral analysis alone maybe you could do this kind of restoration. And this is a nice and a very good idea because the one step further of of acquiring hyperspectral imaging would be hyperspectral reconstruction. So to do a sort of projection of an image with the full spectrum. So in this sense, if I have a faded image, then I record the spectrum. Mathematically, I can maybe, I'm able to, let's say, enhance some parts of the spectrum, and then I can, for example, project it projected the enhanced version. But this is a very good idea. I never did it. It's only in, in my mind. And I never considered, for example, the paintings in the walls, which are a little bit faded. But this is very interesting, because I have some examples in my hometown. This is a, for historical reasons. They decided not to restore some writings on the walls, okay, for, just for historical reasons. But by looking at that, you can faintly see that there was something. Probably from imaging, then you can really enhance what was there. I will do that. <laughs> that, that I, so my idea was uh, to find a way to, let's say, replicate an object, but also to enhance what did great. Yeah. More questions? Comments? There isn't. Let's thank the speaker again.